from anyone who thinks he's been on the porch like a million times or something like that, approximately. Is that, I don't know. I don't even know where he's sitting. Anyway, well, anyway, I hope he's here. Um, you might also know him from It Just Gets Stranger. Please give it up for Eli McCann. Um, I, several years ago, I met this Canadian woman who used to tell these stories that would go on for an eternity, and they were horrible to listen to because there was like no story arc or any point to them, and she would tell an excessive amount of details that had nothing to do with anything. Um, and I'm always worried whenever I come here that that's what I'm going to end up doing, um, and maybe I have, I don't know. Uh, but she, there's this one classic story that my friends will commonly refer to called the Crisco at Costco story. Uh, it was a 45 minute story. It was about buying Crisco at Costco, uh, which has a nice ring to it, but that was the most interesting part of the whole story. And it, it sort of went on for a while of like, well, then I, I can't do a Canadian accent, but it was like, uh, oh, so I went and looked at aisle four and anyway, oh, I ran into this guy I know from Craig. Uh, well, actually, it was a friend of a guy I know. Anyway, so I looked on aisle four, and this is just 45 minutes of this. And I was waiting, like, this story was going on for so long that I thought by the end, like, there was going to be some huge, like, revelation, uh, Mother Teresa about the last uh, Crisco or something. But no, the end of the story was literally, well, anyway, I found it on aisle 17, but you had to buy it in bulk, and I didn't need that much, so I just left. <laughs> so my friends and I will commonly, when I like start telling stories, will commonly refer to this. Like every once in a while, I'll have a friend stop me like five minutes into a story, and, like Eli is this a Crisco at Costco story, which is the code for is this going anywhere? And I, and I get really offended, and then like fifty percent of the time, I'm like, uh, it is <laughs> Crisco at Costco story. Um, I'm a little bit sensitive to that right now because my story actually does start with me going grocery shopping. Uh, it was 2007, I was living in Provo, BYU student at the time, and I went grocery shopping, which is the worst thing anybody has to do. It is a terrible thing, none of us should have to do this. It's worse than laundry, it's worse than camping. Um, it's not worse than both of those things combined, but it's worse than each of them individually. Um, and I hate grocery shopping because when I go grocery shopping, I can never find anything, I'm not competent enough to, to like implicitly know what aisle, like, peanut butter should be on, and so I like look at the uh, aisle where there's laundry detergent or whatever, and I end up walking like 14 miles through the grocery store every time I go. And so, 2007, went grocery shopping, I had just finished walking 14 miles, bought like three items, got in my car, and started driving home, and I was very cranky. And I was driving through my neighborhood and looking at all the houses as I went by, because I don't think that my neighbors are entitled to privacy from me. Um, I learned this from my mother, who when I was a child and would go grocery shopping with her, would uh, wander around the store listening to people's conversations, and sometimes we would stay at the grocery store much longer than we had intended so that we could hear the end of the conversations. But I was driving home and I, I was looking at all these houses and I noticed that there was an old woman laying on, lying on her driveway, um, which is not a normal thing to see. And so I decided to turn around and check it out a little bit more. Um, and mostly because when you see stuff like that, you should you know, get involved as much as possible because my mom also taught me when I was a kid that community is caring, and so I wanted to care. And so I, I pulled up and I noticed that this old woman was not just lying on her driveway, she was lying in what looked like a pool of blood. Um, it was October, it was near Halloween, it was very appropriate timing for this to happen. Um, she was conscious and she was trying to stand up, but having trouble doing so. Um, I'm the worst person in the world to uh, encounter an emergency situation because I don't know what to do. I'm not a competent person. I'm not helpful in emergencies. Uh, I know this about myself. I'm not trying to pretend to be anything that I'm not. And so, but I was the only person around, and so I felt like I had to get involved. And so I walked up to her and um, cautiously, and I said, what seemed appropriate at the time, do you need any help or have you got this? <laughs> she looked at me like I was the biggest moron she had ever seen. Um, she told me that her name was Grace, that she had fallen and bumped her head, and obviously she was like lying in a pool of blood. And she asked me if I would help her get into her house. She said she didn't feel like she could walk into her house and she needed help doing so. Uh, 
I don't know why I did this. I knew that I needed to carry her into her house, um, but I like, didn't carry her the way that would, like a normal person would carry another person. Uh, like, you, like picture the images of like the 9/11 firefighters like emerging from the cloud of dust, holding the victims like they're in the Pieta statue. I like straddled her and like tried to like pick her up to my body, like <laughs> she was a baby. I was trying to burp and um, walked into the house like. I had crapped my pants as her feet like dragged on the ground between my legs. Grace and I got into the house and it was uh, like I had stepped into an episode of Hoarders. Um, there were magazines like stacked all the way to the ceiling. She kept everything she'd ever bought so I knew we were going to get along. And um, there were uh, what by my count maybe seven or eight cats. Uh, and they were jumping from magazine stack to magazine stack. <laughs> And then there was over in the corner this parakeet that kept getting up and like flying directly at the wall and crashing into it, <laughs> dropping to the ground, like going back and like doing the same thing over and over again. And I felt like I had just walked into like the most depressing version of Pee Wee's Playhouse that had ever been recorded. And uh, as, I, as I walked in, she said into my ear, because that's where her head was, I'm so sorry about the mess. Had I known I was going to have company, I would have straightened up. <laughs> And I like suddenly realized that, yes, in fact, I was a guest in her home, and I wasn't sure whether I was supposed to take my shoes off because I didn't know the house rules, but then I was like, I'm dragging like this bleeding corpse through this house right now. It's probably an exception, at least this once. So I, she, she wanted me to take her into her bedroom and put her on her bed, but that felt like a really inappropriate thing to do because she was covered in blood, and so was I by this point. And I didn't want to just plop her onto her bed and have her bed be covered in blood too, so we made a quick detour to the bathroom where I found some towels that were on the floor. And I started dragging the towels with my feet as I was carrying her uh, into her bedroom. And we got into the bedroom, I took the towels somehow and kind of got them onto the bed and tried to like lay her on, onto the bed as well. Um, as I did this, I realized that I, I wasn't sure what the next step was supposed to be, so I told her, I'll, I can help get you cleaned up. Is there anybody that you want me to call? And she said, she asked me if I would call her son, Jimmy. And um, so I, I reached for her phone to call her son, Jimmy, and suddenly there was a knock at the door, a doorbell rang or something. And I paused for a moment. I wasn't sure whether I was supposed to go get the door, like this wasn't my house, and I didn't want to have to go explain to whoever was at the door like why I, this like strange man, was in Grace's house covered in blood. And, um, and so I, I thought like I wouldn't get the door, but then I then realized that maybe like one of the neighbors might have seen me uh, driving like this geriatric bleeding corpse into the house and thinking that like something funny was going on, and, um, and I thought if I don't go get the door, they might call the police, and the, the last thing I needed in my life at that point was to go to prison, because uh, look at this face, it's not the face of someone who does well in prison. And, um, so uh, so I, I said, Grace, let me go see who's at the door, it might be a friend of yours. And so I walked to the door, I opened it up, it is in fact not a friend of hers, it is a door-to-door -door salesman. <laughs> Uh, but not just any door-to-door -door salesman. Do you, does it, do you know the term Zubi? Uh, BYU Zubi? Maybe. It's like a stereotypical BYU student. It doesn't have to be used derogatorily. It usually is. Um, and in this case it would be. Uh, think of like pleated khaki pants, tucked in polo shirt, white socks pulled quarter way up the calf, constantly in the middle of a scavenger hunt. It looks like a little man. <laughs> you know the type. Some of you probably are the type. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that if you don't like going on dates. Um, so uh, he started into this sales pitch, and I don't remember what he was selling, the Bibles or the slap bracelets. I'm not sure. I don't remember what he was selling, but I stopped him a couple seconds into it, and I was in sort of a panic by this point because this was a very scary experience. And I said, I, this now is not really a good time. First of all, this isn't even my house. And second, I've got a bleeding old woman back in the bedroom I need to get back to. And he sort of took a step back and I think noticed for the first time that I was covered in blood. And I realized I probably needed to give like a little bit more of an explanation of this because of the whole prison thing. And so I was like, um, I told him the story and I said, I, it's, it, I got here, there was an old woman on the driveway, she was laying in a pool of blood, I picked her up, I carried her in the house, 
brought her in the back bedroom. I wasn't sure where I was supposed to put her, so I had to get these towels. I had to put them up here on, under her bed so that she wouldn't get her bed all bloody. And then I'm just realizing now, like, why didn't I call 911? Maybe I was supposed to call 911. She wants me to call her son Jimmy, but why am I taking orders from an old woman who just hit her head on the pavement? <laughs> and this guy, uh, we'll say his name is Tyler. Um, it was actually Steve, but uh, <laughs> he was like, takes like another step back from me, and he's like, do you need help? But he kind of said it in a way that like, you don't, you're like hoping they'll say no, but I was like, yes! <laughs> and he did help, and which was very nice of him, which was kind of annoying, because I had decided right from the beginning when I opened the door that I wasn't going to like him, uh, because he was a door-to-door -door salesperson of college age, and I associated him with the summer salespeople, and you know, the summer salespeople that go out and like sell security systems are the, the world's worst humans. And um, <laughs> I should have asked before I said that, does anybody do summer sales? Anybody know anybody who's done summer sales? Yeah, yeah. your friends are probably the exception. <laughs> I'm just kidding, there are no exceptions. <laughs> They're all going straight to hell. Um, so I, invi I, I invited him in and I was like, um, as we're like walking through the magazines and newspapers, I'm like, I am so sorry if we had known there was going to be company straight to hell. Because I was taking ownership of this house and situation now. And I brought him back into Grace's bedroom, and uh, I introduced Grace to Tyler, and I said, "This is Tyler. This is Gr or Grace. This is Tyler. Tyler Grace." And uh, Grace like looked at me like, "Why are you inviting strangers into my house? A person that I don't even know." And um, and I was like, "Calm down, Grace. I can have friends too. It's not so selfish." <laughs> so Grace repeated her request that somebody call her son Jimmy. And I don't want to call Jimmy because talking on the phone with anyone is terrible, but especially just with strangers. And so um, I said, I offered, because I would rather do this than talk to somebody on the phone, I offered to clean up Grace while Tyler called Jimmy, her son, and explained the situation. So Tyler reaches for her cell phone, which was sitting on, on this end table. And as he does so, she says, oh, please don't use my cell phone. I've almost got minutes, because this was back when you had a couple of minutes. And um, some of you are too young to remember that. Um, and so, uh, so he says, "Okay, well, I'll just I can use my phone to do this." But he looks through her phone, finds Jim's number, Jimmy's number, or Jim or something, and he calls it. And I hear this like extremely awkward conversation begin, wherein he says on the phone, uh, "Hi, is this Jim? Um, my name's Tyler, and I'm in your mom's house, and she's bleeding, but she's on the bed, and she seems coherent." And then he sort of stops, and then, like, I was uncomfortable with the way this was going, but to be fair, like, there's no, like, like good way to have that conversation. I, I like, I don't know what I would have said. And, but he kind of stops, and there's, like, some confusion and some back and forth, and then he hangs up the phone, and he says to me, that guy said his mom died a month ago. And both of us, like, slowly turn and look at Grace. <laughs> And I was like, do I have old woman ghost blood on me right now? <laughs> so Tyler then looks at her cell phone again, and he just verified the number, and he says, oh, there are two gyms in here. <laughs> and so I was like, try the second gym. And so he's like, okay. So he like tries the second gym, and we're like, fingers crossed, because I can't deal with this right now, and this woman has actually died a month ago. <laughs> So he calls this one, and this is apparently the correct gym because he's very alarmed that there are two men in Grace's house. And uh, what felt like 20 seconds later, he swooped into the home, scooped up his mother, sort of gave us a um, distracted thank you, and then ran out of the house with her. And Tyler and I were both still standing in this house. And I'm like, what do you do now? And I'm thinking that Tyler and I are both thinking the same thing, but fortunately he spoke before I did because he said, well, I guess I'll take off, and I was going to say, let's see what kind of food she has. But, <laughs> <laughs> so Tyler leaves, and I felt like I couldn't leave because um, community is caring, and I didn't want to like just exit the situation out without knowing what happened to Grace. And also because my mom always taught me you need to leave a place better than you found it. And this was like not better than I found it because now there was blood everywhere. <laughs> and so I thought I would do the nice thing by cleaning up a little bit, starting a load of laundry, soaking like whatever had blood on it. So I began that process. 
And in that process, I had blood on my own shirt. And so I took my shirt off, which felt not awkward in theory, but then when I did it, it felt really awkward. Um, and so I took my shirt off, found some sort of like weird rope thing, and put that on. <laughs> Grace and I were the same size. <laughs> so, and, and I, I started soaking my shirt in the bathroom sink, and I started a load of laundry with like some of the sheets and linens and towels and with some clothes that she just had lying around and it looked like she needed help. And, um, and then I knew I had a little bit of time to kill, so I started like straightening up the front room area in case she did have like more company come later and then she wouldn't have to apologize. And, um, and then the next thing I knew, I was like laying on her bed reading a magazine from 1987, eating some snacks. And all of a sudden I hear like the front door knob like turn. And like it like zapped me back into reality. And I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? How long has it even been? And in come Jim and Grace. And just, in, just as I'm retrieving my shirt from now the dryer that's still slightly down, but I put the put my shirt on and I go out and read them and they both kind of look startled and like maybe I didn't understand like the situation well enough to know that like I, my part was done and I could have left a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at them and I was like, I'm sorry, I probably you probably didn't expect me to still be here, but I didn't know if you still needed me. And Jim said, No, we don't still need you. Um, we appreciate you staying, I guess. <laughs> and um, and he and then he said, you still. And it, I'm so sorry. This, um, you know, we're grateful for your help and everything. And it, by the way, it looks like you still have some blood on your neck, which you know that was really gross. And I looked into the mirror in their front uh, area and started wiping the blood off and realizing the situation that I just got myself into. And I thought, this is exactly why I hate grocery shopping. <laughs>